You are listening to the Spectral Skull Session, tales from the twilight world of myth, mystery, and imagination. The idea behind this podcast is that we explore claims about the occult, supernatural, and paranormal from an analytical standpoint. We're open to the existence of a world beyond the five senses, and we dismiss that dogmatic skepticism that insists that any story about the unexplained has to reduce to hallucinations or swamp gas. But we're not committed to any particular theory or philosophy about what the paranormal is, and we realize that whatever is out there, the answer is likely to be more complicated than any existing model or theory. What we bring to the table is small s skepticism, a skepticism that we throw as much on the mainstream accounts as we do on the supernatural story. Okay, let's get started. Welcome back to the Spectral Skull Session. Today we'll be focusing on new scientific evidence emerging from academia on a possible cometary impact event that occurred in North America. New evidence emerging that a comet exploded over ancient Ohio, sandblasting the Hopewell, Ohio Native Americans from Cincinnati to the Ohio-Virginian border as recently as 1,600 years ago. Researchers associated with the University of Cincinnati have made the case that a branch of the Hopewell Indians were burned and shredded by cometary fragments that left their mark on the entire civilization. They discuss this in their new article, The Hopewell Airburst Event, 1699 to 1567 years ago. This was published February 2nd, 2022 in Nature.com. This is a peer-reviewed journal, so these findings are legitimate and noteworthy. And more importantly, I will be talking you through the evidence. We demand evidence and argument in our search for the truth. And what an argument they have. This team of researchers based at Cincinnati University cite numerous converging lines of evidence that a comet exploded in the airspace over Ohio, creating a firestorm that may have torched the entire region and showered multiple communities with fragments of metal. Now, as some background, the Hopewells are often referred to as the Hopewell Exchange System. They were a loose network of communities that engaged in trade and communication all along the rivers and lakes that crisscross the Midwestern and Eastern United States and into Canada. At its greatest extent, the Hopewell exchange system ran from the northern shores of Lake Ontario south to the Crystal River Indian Mountains in modern-day Florida. There were significant concentrations of Hopewell communities along the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys, beginning at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Ohio is formed by the confluence of the Algonany, and Mokalania Rivers, I'm mispronouncing that. It ends 980 miles later at Cairo, Illinois, where it empties into the Mississippi. The Mississippi River is the second longest river in North America, flowing 2,350 miles from its source in Minnesota through the center of the continental United States to the Gulf of Mexico. So there was an extensive system of water roads that the Hopewell Native Americans were able to use to trade The Hopewell exchange system flourished from 100 B.C. to 500 A.D. The main reason we know about its existence is we can study the burial sites, ruins, and mounds all along major rivers and lakes in the U.S. and southern Canada. And we find these artifacts that must have been taken from neighboring regions, constructed from or by using tools that would have had to come from another area. For example, some artifacts from all around the Hopewell network are made from copper indicating that they were brought from the upper Great Lakes, where it's easy to get copper. Others are made from mica, which is most easily located in the Carolinas. They've also found shells from the Gulf of Mexico, as far north as Canada, as well as obsidian from the Rocky Mountains, all over the region. And one of the things they are also known to have traded, these Hopewells, they are known to have traded artifacts made from meteorites, Hopewell archaeological sites in the Ohio River Valley contain an anomalously high concentration and diversity of meteorites. They include iron meteorites, stony iron meteorites, and merely stony meteorites. Now, this has typically been explained by archaeologists by citing the tremendous trade and cultural network of the Hopewells. The idea seems to be that these people loved exotic materials. One of the exotic materials they had a particular hankering for were space rocks. So there would have been an economic incentive for anyone along the network to scour their locality in search of meteorites, which they could then trade for other valuable materials. 
But now researchers are suggesting that the uh, Hopewell obsession with and easy access to space rocks may have been in part the result of a traumatic encounter some of the Hopewell community had with these rocks from space. Now, we know the Hopewell exchange system declined mysteriously around 500 AD. It's been thought it had to do with changing climate or an increase in warfare, but this new paper suggests it may have been cultural confusion induced by the destruction of the Ohioan Hopewells by a cometary impact. So why are these researchers so convinced that a comet did impact? Well, they investigated 11 Hopewell earthwork sites in Ohio. These are building-sized mounds and shapes laid into the ground and scattered all around the Ohio River. At some of these sites, they found black to clear microspheroids up to 0.4 millimeters in diameter. These are made of iron and silicon. They are basically balls of molten rock that result when something uh, metallic explodes. So I guess they're not molten rock, they're molten metal. They are the result of something very high temperature, made of metal, exploding. It explodes into these droplets, which turn into microspheres. They also found large quantities of sand-sized uh, meteorites called palisites scattered around. And both these microspherules and the palisites were found at the same depth as significant charcoal scarring. They also found iridium and platinum residue. And in the paper they published, they've charted areas where there seemed to be like a plume of iridium and platinum that came out from impact sites. And finally, they found um, widespread conflagration, evidence of widespread burning of vegetable matter and human housing. Together, the meteorite sand, the metallic microspheroids, the residue of rare earth elements like platinum and iridium, uh, and the charcoal, they all paint a picture of fire and shrapnel falling from the sky and wreaking havoc on small communities along the Ohio River Valley region. At one point, the authors note limestone from burned structures was reduced to calcium oxide, which indicates a peak temperature of over 765 degrees Celsius. That is 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. So these people may have just been baked alive. This is astonishing. Multiple lines of evidence, right? Little bits of debris from meteorites, molten metal that has turned into spheres, as well as rare earth residues found in a pattern suggestive of impact. The main focus of their paper is establishing that some kind of bombardment did in fact take place by doing numerous samples, and doing forensic analysis, but they also bring in legends from around the America. So here is a quote from that paper, and I will be brutally butchering all of the Native American terms, but these are legendary uh, observations that are from existing Native American tribes. They say, quote, the Miamia observed an ancient comet, which they call Lenipsia, a horned serpent that crossed the sky and dropped rocks on the land before plummeting into the river. The Shawnee word, Tecomise, refers to a comet known as the Sky Panther. The Hawden Sawney say that the Sky Panther has the power to tear down forests. Ottawa oral histories describe a day when the sun fell from the sky, and the Huron and Wayandat recount a time when a black cloud rolled across the sky and was destroyed with a fiery dart. These millennial generational oral histories are deeply rooted in eyewitnessed events, end quote. So here we have a documented case of peer-reviewed scientists bringing in legends, almost in an evidential way. It's a small aspect of the paper, but I thought it was quite astonishing to see them cite these stories. They also make the case that at the Milford earthwork site, this is a site very close to Cincinnati, where there's significant moundage. These uh, native peoples have built some kind of burial mound system that you can see from the sky. And the paper says, look, there's a comet. They made a giant comet hundreds of feet long uh, out of earthwork. So I couldn't really see it in the pictures they had because it's been turned into a park, but they had a little diagram. 
The diagram appeared to have been drawn maybe in the 19th century. So it's possible that um, people ruined the earthworks and now we just have 19th century records to go on. But it does look like a comet to me. And I'll try to put uh, a link to this research paper as well as a shortcut to that image of the comet right on the website. So anyone interested can take a look at that. I thought it was interesting overall that these researchers felt confident in using oral stories from around the region, as far north as Canada, oral stories about lights in the sky, creatures in the sky, um, as kind of supporting evidence. It's possible that they're not really using it as evidence. They're just using, they're just kind of throwing it out there in the paper. But um, it's, it seems to play an evidential role. And so I actually reached out to uh, Dr. Tanksley, who is the, um, he's listed as the contact person for the research paper. Uh, I was not able to talk to him. He declined to come on the show, but I did learn he's an enrolled member of the Pika tribe. So he may be well-versed in Native American oral stories. Now, when I reached out to Dr. Tanksley, I was interested in a couple things that I'm still very uncertain about regarding this story. I just want to tell you about the things that I'm uncertain of. I want to know the extent of the devastation to the region. So they studied sites as far west as Dearborn County, Indiana, as far east as the Marietta Earthworks on the Ohio-Virginia border, as far south as the Indian Fort Mountain in Kentucky. Together, these sites form a triangle that is 250 miles long by the hypotenuse. If the points of this triangle were all located in an oval, if they uh, inscribed an oval, and if that oval described the blast area, the extent of cometary devastation, it would mean thousands of square miles of territory and multiple sites were burned and showered by debris. I don't know if the researchers would agree this is the best interpretation, because it could also be that cometary fragments fell randomly over the area. Possibly after the fragments hit, the Hopewell natives came and built shrines at each site, and maybe only at one or a couple sites where people and habitation actually directly impacted. So it could have been scattershot destruction that later became culturally important, perhaps even religiously important, to these native people. I also wanted to ask the researchers how they view the legends about cometary impact in relation to their own forensic evidence. Do they, in fact, want us to treat these legends as a source of positive evidence supporting a cosmic impact event having cultural significance. I just don't know how they see the legends with respect to um, supporting their hypothesis. And most strikingly, um, the paper actually includes a diagram of the Hopewell burial mound site, which I already told you, the, the Milford earthwork. And um, I did want to clarify with them what is their evidence that the object depicted is a comet? How certain are they that that diagram is a faithful rendition of the way the earthworks actually were constructed? But as I said, I could not get them to come on the show. At least I could not get Dr. Tangsterly to come on the show or to clarify. So I may reach out to other researchers on that team and see if I can learn more. In any event, you can read the paper for yourself. It's free online. Again, the title is The Hopewell Airburst Event. So that is amazing. It adds to our body of knowledge about cosmic events interacting with humanity. It suggests that cometary impacts may have been more common than appreciated. And for me, it reinforces that early human beings were probably very star-oriented. They had many reasons to pay attention to space. Now we know of one more reason. Now we know they would have seen more of the night sky than we do. We know they would have needed to pay attention to the night sky to decide when to plant and when to harvest, possibly as well when to navigate and where to navigate. And now we have reason to believe they were directly influenced by impact events. So I think these people, ancient peoples around the world, were probably on the whole much more oriented to the skies than we are today. I think this is important because all throughout the ancient cultural texts, and myths that we have access to. There are countless stories of celestial beings, beings that often come down from the sky to interact with humanity in various ways, often to guide us, just as often to just cause mischief. Without getting into that old 
ancient alien's chestnut. It's worth taking stock. For ancient people, it was easier to imagine space as a populated place, an animated place, a place filled with magic, mystery, and real-life danger than it is for so many of us who cannot see the sky, who do not look up on a regular basis. And I contend to you that may be because they were literally encountering aliens, but just as easily, it might be that they were paying more attention to their environment. We who spend our lives looking at screens and following stories about what humans are doing to each other, maybe we've lost something. Maybe we've become boring, unimaginative, self-obsessed people. And maybe the cure for that, or at least a step towards a cure, is just to go outside, look up at the sky whenever you can, and try to regain some awareness of how small we are, how uncertain we must be about our role in the universe. Until next time, I have been Dane. Stay strange and stay sane.